So I'm going to talk about um, mostly about consistency, but uh, towards the end, how to use code generation to maintain consistency in a um, application, um, specifically an uh, application that has many smaller bits um, rather than one uh, larger application like a Rails, Rails app or something similar. Um, I'll give more context. Um, so I'm going to start with a description of the project I was working on while, when I came up with this um, idea. Um, so we were building a wearable device. Those are kind of fun. Um, ours was a baby monitor. So it was um, like an anklet that sits on the baby's ankle um, and uh, collects sensor data, pushes up to the server, um, runs some analytics on the server, and push down predictions about um, when the baby's going to wake up, did the baby roll over, things like that. Um, so my part in this uh, project was um, anything that touched the server. <laughs> so that was a lot of stuff. Um, so the biggest problem that, um, that I had, especially in terms of consistency, was that we had a lot of teams. Um, we had a hardware team, a firmware team, data science team, iOS team, um, even though we were pretty small. Um, and so each team had their own data format. So um, I'll talk more about that in the coming slides. Um, but you can see sort of how, uh, how that might lead to inconsistencies if each team is expecting the, data, the same data to come in a different format. Um, so the pieces of the project, I'm going to break it up um, into how each piece interacted with the server. Um, so we'll start with the wearable. Uh, so the wearable, the data gets pushed up to the server. So um, the, the team that was responsible for this was the firmware team. Um, some raw format that I don't really understand or never really asked. Um, so the data goes um, to up to the server in JSON, JSON format, um, to the REST API, or through the REST API to the server. Um, and that team was me. And uh, I wanted it to be in a Go struct. Um, so the next piece was our database. We had, we had a, a two databases, but the one for the sensor data. Um, we used uh, DynamoDB, or we, they did at the time. I'm not with the company anymore. But um, so again, pushing data in JSON format um, up, up to the Amazon database. And I didn't really get to talk to the AWS team. The spec was sort of um, just finalized already. Um, so go struct to um, JSON up to DynamoDB. Then we've got the models, too. The, um, sorry, the models that the data science team built, which are running um, algorithms to predict um, uh, baby's state and also future for baby. Um, so we thought a lot about um, how to implement the models, and we ended up going with um, a Go implementation which was challenging because there aren't as many data science libraries in Go as there are in Python, um, or I guess R or something. Um, but we did it um, mostly so that we could reuse the Go structs. Um, and the final bit was the end user or iOS device. So JSON again, and turns into an instance of an Objective-C class. Um, so we need to keep all of these pieces consistent, specifically the format of the data in this case. But there's also um, how, how to push the data. What, what, is the, what is the server expecting? What is the iOS device expecting? Um, so uh, I, just, I concluded, I guess. I think this is maybe a given. But um, for, to get a consistency across all the pieces, you need communication across the teams. Um, I'm going really fast, sorry. 
Um, so my biggest problem with this communication thing um, was I, I couldn't get my team to read my docs. Um, it was really annoying, especially because I worked so hard on them. <laughs> and um, so they ask me a lot of questions, and I don't have time to answer all the questions. So some of them don't get answered, and then we've got inconsistencies. Um, yeah, we don't want that. So I asked um, one of our engineers, uh, an iOS engineer, why aren't you reading my docs? Um, and she said, because sometimes they're inaccurate. Um, and, it, uh, and I sort of thought, oh, yeah, duh. But sometimes um, I realized that if the docs are sometimes inaccurate, they might as well always be inaccurate because the developer doesn't know what's accurate and what's not. Um, so I concluded that docs have to be 100% accurate 100% of the time. Um, and this sounds really daunting. So I thought I'd make a computer do it for me. Um, so I had an idea. Um, so I had my first attempt at a solution for this um, failed, but I'm going to talk about it anyway. Um, so I thought, OK, what if I um, test my API documentation if I run it against my actual API. If I just do that, incorporate that in, the, in, our, CI, in our CI builds, and just that way I'd never push a red build. Um, I mean, I'd never, <laughs> sorry, I'd never push an accurate documentation. Um, it failed for two reasons. Um, the first was uh, the tool I used produced inconsistent builds. I just, sometimes they were red and sometimes they were green, and it was usually because like a string had a different character or something um, irrelevant like that. And I could have built a second tool, but this, um, built my own tool. But the second piece was that um, when the test failed, the doc test failed, I had to manually update the docs, which took more than an hour every single time um, of just copy pasting JSON everywhere. Um, and that wasn't very much fun. So, I want, so just very briefly, um, um, so it was really easy for me to remember to update my docs when I added an endpoint or when I deleted an endpoint or changed the auth method or um, big things like that. But when I changed column names in that in database that then got reflected over to the JSON, when I deleted columns or renamed a table, those are the things that I really missed um, in the docs, and all of those little things added up. So anyway, so this attempt failed, and so I put this problem aside for, um, for a while, and then I came across a book. Um, it's actually a book that my mom lent me about two years ago, and I just opened it six months ago, and um, I regret not opening it sooner. It was called uh, The Mythical Man Month. It's a very cool book if you haven't read it. Um, it's much older than I am, so anyway. Um, and so there was one really cool idea in this book. I didn't finish, I haven't finished the book yet, but um, this idea sort of uh, began um, my talk here today. Um, and that was the idea of a design doc. And maybe you think that's silly that I'd never thought of having a design doc. Um, but it sounded really cool. So I abstracted, or I added on to that. What if I have an endpoint design doc? So a document that describes, um, sorry, a document that describes, wait, I've got this speaker notes on the wrong slide. Generic definitions for endpoint behavior. So Every endpoint follows a, some set of rules in this design doc. So if you need to add a new endpoint, you first need to make sure that um, this functionality or similar functionality isn't represented already in your design doc. Um, so this way, when a new developer comes to add another endpoint, um, they can either see, oh, someone's already implemented something similar. I'll just copy these patterns. Um, 
or else add their own patterns. So the idea behind this be sort of um, behavior consistency is um, to sort of make the docs, the API documentation obsolete. Uh, so what I mean by that is um, if all the endpoints are consistent, if they all follow a pattern, all the create endpoints follow you know, some consistent pattern, all the de destroy endpoints follow a pattern, all the auth endpoints follow a pattern, um, if all endpoints are consistent in behavior, the developers can predict what the next endpoint will look like based on another one they've seen before. So they don't even need documentation for the most part, except for that initial endpoint. Um, so I thought that was cool. Um, so I'm, I'm going to list three pieces. So that was, that was the first piece um, that I came up with to um, help with my consistency problem. Uh, the next stems from my love of tests. Um, so I thought, wow, huh, what if I had endpoint consistency tests? Sort of similar to my original idea, but um, tests that check, that take your design doc and check that each endpoint follows the design doc. Um, all right, got that right there. So, um, so you can again this way ensure that all endpoints are consistent. So developers can predict endpoint behavior and structure, and so the developers don't need your documentation. Um, and yeah, so, <laughs> sorry. The third, the third piece, which I think is kind of, um, I already touched on it a bit, just API docs, so making sure they're accurate. Um, so developers need a place to look up endpoint behavior when they can't predict it. Um, so I'm going to go really early. I'm going to end it really early. Sorry, guys. Um, so we've got three pieces, uh, the first being an endpoint design doc, um, the second being endpoint consistency tests, and the third being accurate API docs. Um, so if you think about what an endpoint design doc has, um, it has the structure, the requests and the responses, how they should look generically for all endpoints. So if you take a list of resources, perhaps in the format of um, ghost structs or text, um, sort of an abstract idea right now, but if you take a list of, of resources and the methods, the REST methods are, um, the, the methods that you can, that are applicable to that um, resource, the combination, with the, the combination of the two things, you can generate all the endpoints, theoretically. Um, I didn't really want to do this because, or, sorry, you can generate the requests and responses. You can't really generate the implementation, or um, I can't think of a good way to do it, um, mostly because all of the details you need um, are not in the design doc, the details for the, implementing the business logic. So what you can do, though, is generate tests that will check your endpoints against your design doc. Um, I bet you can see what the next one is. So now we look at these endpoint consistency tests. Um, so they're running through all of your endpoints. All of the requests and responses are available during, the test, during testing. Um, the headers, the URLs, the pra all parameters. Um, so API docs are really just a list of requests and responses and with some extra descriptions, metadata, and, um, and such. So we can really just generate our API docs as well. Um, so I, I wanted to show an example, but unfortunately I ran out of time to prepare. Um, but um, if you, it's a cool concept. Like, all you have to write is a design doc, and you've got tests for all your 200 cases. You still have to write the edge case test. And you've got documentation that's totally accurate. Um, yeah, I thought that was cool. So that's generally my talk. I would give a demo. I've got um, 
if you look me up on GitHub, I'm Adam, it's not there, but Adams hyphen Sarah, my project for generating um, API docs from your unit tests is called test to doc, where the, I should have written this down. I've got a better idea. It's not very big. Oh, nope. Just kidding. Well, test to doc. You just have to remember it. Um, um, yeah, so that's, that's essentially my talk. I'm sorry, I'm very under. But um, hopefully you got something out of it. Cheers. <laughs>